Okay, so in this video, we're going to explore the structures and functions of the cerebral hemispheres. If you all remember from the last video, we talked about how the cerebral hemispheres were derived from the telencephalon, and they're these large structures that account for 83% of your brain mass. Now, on the surface, we actually had a lot of folded appearance there because of something called gyri and sulci. Gyri were the ridges, which are the external folds. Sulci are the infoldings or shallow grooves that are formed as well. Now, fissures are these deep grooves that help separate different brain regions. Like the longitudinal fissure is what separates the two cerebral hemispheres, and the transverse cerebral fissure is what separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum. Now, if you look at the uh, external surface of the brain here, we would find that all the hills here are examples of gyri. Now these gyri are important because what they do is they add surface area to the outer surface of the brain, which means we can actually have more brain matter uh, due to these folds. And uh, this is something that actually allows us to have more cells and therefore more computational power. So if you look here, the kind of the infoldings that are nearby would be the sulci. So that if the gyri are the hills, the sulci would be the valleys. And then what separates the two cerebral hemispheres down here is the longitudinal fissure separate the two. On this side, you see blood vessels. Just, just on, the, on this side, the right side of the brain, they've dissected the blood vessels away so you can see the gyri and sulci better. Now, uh, we can divide the cerebral hemispheres into five major lobes. We got the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, occipital, temporal, and there'll be one more deeper in here called the insula. Now, the insula is located between the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe in a space here called the uh, transverse fissure. So the frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital lobes, and the insula um, are involved with a variety of functions, and you have these lobes on each cerebral hemisphere. So if you have right and left cerebral hemispheres, that means you have right and left frontal lobes, right and left parietal, and so on. So if you looked at the lobes, uh, they're differentiated anatomically, and what separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe is something called the central sulcus here. And uh, what separates the temporal lobe from the frontal lobe is something called lateral sulcus, as well as what separates the parietal lobe from the occipital lobe is the parieto occipital sulcus. And then what separates the entire cerebrum from the cerebellum is the transverse cerebral hemisphere, I'm sorry, fissure. So if you took a cross section of the, of the lobes here, like on the outer surface of the cerebral hemispheres, you'd find that, that the outermost layer is gray matter, and then the innermost layers are white matter. Now, it's not to say that you don't find gray matter deeper within the cerebral hemispheres. It's just that the cortex, which is the outer layer here, is made of gray matter. In fact, cortex means bark. So if you think of the cortex as being like the outermost layers of your brain, like the bark on a tree, that's what you see here, cortex. And the cortex is made of many layers of uh, neuron cell bodies, which is why it has kind of a darker appearance to it. So the insula you can see here, which is the fifth lobe, and it's locked in between the frontal and temporal lobes and the lateral sulcus. But if you pull these apart, you'd find the insular lobe, which is just kind of a deeper infolding of the cerebral hemisphere. Now, the cortex is the executive suite of your brain. And what this means is that it's the site of consciousness. So things like awareness, sensory perception, voluntary motion, communication, memory storage, understanding, all of this is what, what's sort of derived from the cerebral cortex. So those, all those gyri we talked about earlier, those serve very specific functions with these types of mental processes. Now, uh, the cortex is made of a thin layer, sort of two to four millimeters. That's gray matter. It's made of neuron cell bodies, dendrites, glial cells, and blood vessels. But you don't really find a lot of axons here because those project into the white matter of the brain. Now, uh, because of the fact these are made of cells, it accounts for about 40% of your brain's mass and because they're heavier and more dense. Now, imaging uh, for the brain can yield some insight into function. So we have something called fMRI, which is functional magnetic resonance imaging. And ultimately, what this tells us about is about different levels of brain activity in different periods of time. So if you use this type of scanner um, in a living person and had that person perform different tasks, you'd see what areas of their brains are most active in response to that task. So you see if that they're only asked to see something that involves the occipital lobe here, or if they're hearing it, that involves primarily the temporal lobe. Speaking involves the posterior portion of the frontal lobe, and then thinking is just sort of generally all over, just a more distributed type of function.
Now, uh, there are four general considerations of the cortex. Uh, for one, we have three types of functional areas. We got motor, sensory, and association areas that we'll talk about. Each hemisphere is also concerned with the opposite side of the body. So when you think about like the motor areas that control the left side of your body, like your left arm, well, that's gonna involve neurons that are on the right side of your cerebral hemisphere. Now, we also find that there's something called lateralization, which is a specialization of cortical function to different hemispheres. Like if you ever heard of right brain versus left brain, there's some truth behind this in terms of where certain functions are sort of located in the average individual. Now, conscious behavior involves the entire cortex in one way or another. So if we look at the cerebral cortex again here in this view, you can find that we can divide this not even just by its lobes, but also the functional areas. That's ultimately what this slide is showing. So you can see that the frontal lobe here contains a lot of different things like the premotor cortex, the Broca's area, your primary motor cortex as well, and something called the frontal eye field. Now, uh, the parietal lobe back here contains things like your primary somatosensory cortex, association cortex, as well as portions of the gustatory cortex and Wernicke's area. And uh, the temporal lobe contains things like the primary auditory cortex, portions of Wernicke's area, and um, even deeper has things like the hippocampus, which is involved with learning and memory. And the occipital lobe back here is involved with things like your primary visual cortex and association areas. Now we'll go into the functions of these different regions, but just keep in mind that they're localized to specific lobes. So the primary motor cortex was um, a portion of the frontal lobe. In fact, it actually is the very posterior part of the frontal lobe that makes something called the precentral gyrus. Now the primary motor cortex or primary somatic motor cortex contains pyramidal cells, which are large motor neurons that allow for conscious control of precise skilled skeletal muscle movements. So when you think about like controlling skeletal muscle around your body, ultimately it's gonna to relate to these pyramidal cells. Now the axons of these pyramidal cells project down what are called corticospinal tracts, which form long axons that go down your spinal cord and then synapse with uh, the secondary motor neurons in your spinal cord. Now what's interesting though is if you look at the map of these cells in the brain, they actually form what we call somatotopy. Soma means body, topy means map. So that all the muscles of your body can be mapped to a specific area on the primary motor cortex, forming something called the motor homunculus which is an upside down caricature that represents contralateral or opposite side of the body innervation of different body regions. So this is showing the motor homunculus um, and sensory homunculus, but you can see the motor here on the left. And uh, ultimately what, what we see here is that, uh, this area of the primary somatic motor cortex. These are the neurons that are involved with the muscles that are found in these specific areas of the body. So you can see that if you're looking at this specific area of the cortex, you know, that's going to uh, be involved with muscles that control your toes or muscles of your calf or muscles of your trunk. You can see that muscles of the hand uh, have a pretty big representation on the brain as well as the muscles of your face. In fact, the reason why these aren't drawn to scale is that, you know, the, obviously the face is much larger than normal here, proportional to the size of the trunk, because there's so much brain matter that's dedicated just to controlling the muscles of your face. So the homunculus man here uh, is represented proportional to the amount of brain matter that controls those muscles. And you can see that not all body parts are controlled by the same amount of brain matter, like Obviously, the hand is much larger than the arm here because there's a lot more brain matter dedicated to controlling the skilled muscle movements of your hand versus the unskilled movements of, say, your trunk. You can see there's also a sensory homunculus over here that we'll talk about um, in the future slide. Now, the premotor cortex is involved with helping to plan movements. So when you think about like you know planning to do a particular activity, that is involved with the premotor cortex. So it's a staging area for skilled motor activity. So it, it's involved with controlling learn, repetitious, or patterns motor skills, and it coordinates simultaneous actions, as well as controls voluntary actions that depend on sensory feedback. So, you know, if someone gives you the command to, hey, could you hand me that mug, and you hear that, process that, grab the mug, and then hand it to them, you know, the planning of that and understanding of that, in part, involves the premotor cortex. Now, Broca's area is also another region of the frontal lobe. This is, in, this is actually the motor speech area. So if you're talking and you're making planned movements for vocalization, um, this is what Broca's area is involved with. 
So it's no surprise that it's found pretty close to the somatic motor cortex, or the primary motor cortex, because this is the brain region that's specifically involved with speech production and controlling the muscles that are involved with vocalization. Uh, this is also kind of close to the frontal eye field, which controls voluntary eye movements. Now, nearby, in the, in the parietal lobe, we have something called the primary somatosensory cortex. In fact, this is the very anterior part of the parietal lobe, forming something called the postcentral gyrus. Now, it receives general sensory information from skin, proprioceptors, skeletal muscles, and joints. That's why it's somatosensory. So we learned earlier how somatosensation are all the sensory information that comes from skin, fascia, joints, and muscle. And we call those proprioceptors, which are involved with the sensation of your body's position in space. So it's involved with spatial discrimination, so identifying like you know uh, where your body is without having to look at it. And even associated with this, we have a somatosensory homunculus. So it's, again, it's an upside-down caricature of all the sensory feedback from your body that's conscious coming back to your brain. So going back to our map here, remember we talked about the motor homunculus, which is the precentral gyrus, and over here shows the sensory homunculus, which is on the postcentral gyrus, the parietal lobe. So what this represents, though, is now instead of motor, these are the parts of the brain that would receive sensory information from areas like your foot or your hand or your face or your tongue or your digestive organs. And you can find here that also these are not drawn to proportion of the body. So you can see that the feet are much larger than, than the leg here. And your trunk is obviously much smaller than your hands would normally be. Now, the reason why these body parts are drawn uh, disproportionately uh, to the body is that they're actually going to be proportional instead to the amount of brain matter that's dedicated to these body parts. You can see that the hand is very sensitive because there's a large part of the brain that receives quite a tremendous amount of sensory information from your hands. Same with your face and lips and tongue and feet. You know, all these will be very sensitive body regions because there's so much brain matter dedicated to that. And also looking on this map, you can see that the areas like your trunk and your limbs uh, are also pretty insensitive. You know, things like your abdominal organs are also pretty not widely represented on this uh, cortex, which means they're also pretty insensitive. And that explains why we don't really feel things the same way all throughout our body. Now, the somatosensory association cortex is located just posterior to the somatosensory cortex. This is involved with uh, integrating sensory input from lots of different uh, modalities. And so it's going to help determine size, texture, and relationship of parts. So to give you an example of this, uh, let's say if your eyes were closed or it was dark, and you're feeling around for your phone in the dark. Uh, when you start to touch your phone, you can feel, okay, there's a flat surface, and there's kind of a rubber surface, and there's what feels like buttons on the side. Well, it's the somatosensory association cortex that would take all, that, all those independent pieces of information and then put that all together to help you understand, that, oh, I'm feeling a phone here. So you need this for more complex recognition of, you know, textures and that kind of stuff. So the visual areas of your brain are primarily going to be localized to the occipital lobe. So the primary visual cortex is the posterior tip of the occipital lobe. Uh, it's buried in what's called the calcarine sulcus, but it receives visual information from your retinas. Now the visual association area, again, like the other association area we talked about, is involved with taking lots of more complex individual pieces of information and then put that together to form a unified under understanding of your experience. So an example of this could be something like recognizing faces. So when you look at a face, you don't look at it all at once. Rather, you focus on individual parts like each eye and the nose and the, you know, the distance between your eyes and nose and the shape of the face itself and other identifying features. So what happens is the visual association area then would take all those individual pieces, put them together to help you recognize, oh, hey, that is President Barack Obama. That's his face, right? Because you can recognize those individual parts. So this is more complex processing that involves a pretty large part of the uh, occipital lobe, and uh, this includes the visual association area. Now, there are auditory areas in the brain as well, and again, these are mostly localized to the temporal lobes. So the primary auditory cortex is found in the superior margin of the temporal lobe, and it interprets information from your inner ear, like pitch, loudness, and location. But we need an association area, which is found in the uh, posterior portion of the temporal lobe, and it actually helps us to store memories of sounds and permit perception of sounds as well. Like for instance, if you're hearing a song, you're hearing all the individual pieces of that song, but your auditory association area can put all those individual pieces so that you can understand uh, that that is a particular song rather than just a bunch of random noises. Now the vestibular cortex is found as part of the insula, 
and it's just adjacent to the parietal cortex. Now, the vestibular cortex is involved with conscious awareness of balance. So this portion of your brain receives information from the vestibular centers of your inner ear that help you understand your head's position in space. The olfactory cortex is also found in the medial aspect of the temporal lobes, and um, it receives information about smell. Now, what's interesting then is that uh, this is not only involved with just the conscious awareness of odor, but it's also linked up with the learning and memory centers of your brain, which we'll talk about later. So there's an interesting association between smells and memories. But when you think about the olfactory cortex, think about the temporal lobes because that's where it's located. Now, the gustatory cortex is for taste, and this is involved also, I'm sorry, it's also found in the insula, but it's also involved with this uh, perception of taste. So if you're tasting something and you're getting that information about sweet, salty, sour, bitter, umami, you know that information is being sent to the gustatory cortex in your insula. We also have a visceral sensory area. It's also in the posterior gustatory cortex. This is involved with perception of you know, conscious vis visceral sensations. In fact, what's interesting is that these are side by side in the brain. So it's no surprise that we often associate bad tastes with, you know, kind of gut feelings, right? So you might say that, you know, uh, some, this experience left a bad taste in my mouth or, you know, like uh, that made my stomach upset because these areas are pretty close to each other. And because they're also associated with learning and memory and emotional centers, we often describe our emotions using things like tastes or gut sensations. So just to summarize what we found here with the cortex, remember your frontal lobe contains things like your precentral gyrus, which is the primary motor cortex. Nearby, we have the premotor cortex, which is what was involved with planning of motor movements. And close to that, we had the Broca's area, which was involved with the motor speech area. And we had the anterior association area, or prefrontal cortex, which is involved with higher order functioning like morality and judgment. You had the parietal lobe, which was involved with the primary somatosensory cortex for touch. We had our uh, Wernicke's area for uh, sensations of, of verbal and written words. We had our temporal lobes for the olfactory cortex and the auditory cortex, and our occipital lobes, which had our pr visual areas, like our primary uh, visual cortex and our visual association area. Now, if you look at a, at a cross-sectional view of the cerebral hemisphere, you can see things like your olfactory cortex better because um, it's located deeper in the temporal lobes. Now, there are multimodal association areas um, with the brain as well. And this, these receive inputs from multiple sensory areas, and they send outputs to multiple areas as well. Now, it gives us meaning to information that's received, and it stores it in memory, ties it to previous experience, and helps us decide actions. So when you think about like the sensations, the thoughts, and emotions that make us conscious, that's going to involve these multimodal association areas. So we also talk about lateralization of the cortex because different cerebral hemispheres have, you know, um, are more associated with certain functions. So when you think of like cerebral dominance, this, this refers to the fact that some people, their personalities are more sort of uh, dominant to certain characteristics. And that would that in that regard, you might say that someone's like right brain dominant or left brain dominant. That just refers to the functions that are associated with the right and left cerebral hemispheres. So the left cerebral hemispheres involved with categorical functions like language, math, and logic. The right cerebral hemispheres involved with visual spatial skills, intuition, emotion, artistic and musical ability. So when you think about like who you are as an individual, you know where your personality and personal attributes might fall under these particular um, you know functions. That's when you talk about dominance, right? So like if you're a good communicator and and a math whiz uh, or really good at math mathematical logical functions, then you could say that you're maybe left brain dominant and categorically dominant. Um, now most individuals though are going to be a good mix of of both of these. Because, you know, if you were only good at language, math, and logic, but not good at intuition, emotion, artistic, and musical skills, you know, uh, that wouldn't be very, um, you know, well-received in society. Now, uh, hemispheres communicate almost instantaneously through fiber tracks, which is why, you know, we don't think about these as being completely separate. They're actually interlinked and interconnected in terms of their functions.